so we gonna continue this uh, speculation around uh, uh, nocturnal history architecture with uh, uh, one of the uh, most uh, established uh, architectural historian uh, of this country, uh, Martin Del Becke, that is a specialist in particular of Baroque uh, Roman architecture and uh, of uh, the rhetorical transposition uh, of uh, arguments uh, in stones, uh, if I can say in this way. And um, he will uh, um, be the first of this afternoon. Uh, uh, the second presentation will be done by uh, Lea Catherine uh, Saska. Uh, she was here with us before. And she's coming, she just wrote me, and she's a little bit in late, and she has to, to start. So um, the, the, the first presentation, oh, she just arrived. Thank you. And uh, so the first, uh, I let the, um, Professor Del Becke to, uh, to, to start uh, with this lecture about uh, the ephemeral part of uh, of. Uh, I don't know how to translate in English apparati, my you tool you let in. Uh, so I just yeah. only read the title of your lecture and then I let you speak. So the title of what we're gonna listen now is Chasing Darkness, Night and Shadow in the Ephemeral Apparati of Baroque Rome. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. I will share my uh, presentation. So uh, thank you first of all for the invitation, uh, which uh, surprised me a little bit because I've never actually really worked on the question of night and darkness uh, in architecture. Uh, of course, uh, I've been looking at ephemeral architecture uh, in 17th century Rome where artificial light and darkness play uh, uh, kind of role, uh, an important role, but I never actually um, thematized it. So I've considered this uh, talk as an invitation to bring together material that I've been looking at over, over, over the years, which may, I hope, um, bring some elements for the discussion about uh, a nocturnal uh, history of uh, architecture. So I will get uh, started. It's also quite text heavy uh, presentation. Uh, forgive me for that. But again, we can discuss about everything uh, afterwards. So uh, I will immediately dive into it. On the first Sunday of Advent 1617, the Italian community in, in London was treated to a sermon by an exceptional uh, preacher. Marcantonio di Dominis had been a Jesuit and a bishop before he came to England and converted to Anglicanism. Some years after he uh, delivered the, the sermon that we are going to discuss, he would return to the Catholic fold and he, he would then be condemned of heresy and actually burned. Uh, but on this particular occasion, so uh, in the advent of 1617, the Dominus was still eager uh, to weigh his newly found faith uh, against the old, uh, his Anglicanism against uh, Catholicism. Now, uh, for the sermon, uh, the Dominus chose the theme from the epistle that is read on the first Sunday uh, of Advent, which I highlighted here. Uh, taken from the Roman Missal, verse 13 of Paul's letter to the Romans, Nox precessit dies autem apropin quavit. The night is almost over, the day is almost there. Which is, of course, highly appropriate as a forecast of the birth of Christ, uh, the arrival of a new day in the deep uh, of winter. So, and this is then uh, the, the sermon. This is the best image that I could get from uh, Google Books. Uh, now, the Dominus built his sermon, uh, built his sermon on a proposition that, uh, according to Paul, uh, the verse refers to three kinds of nights: the nights of ignorance, uh, of sin, uh, of and of negligence. And to these three metaphorical nights, uh, the Dominus adds a fourth, 
which is the night of error. And then the sermon proceeds by explaining in detail the nature of each of these nights and how, of course, they can be overcome. So the night of ignorance is the lack of knowledge of divine things, as was the conditions of the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, and the Dominus asked, and I quote, what else is the night but the absence of sun? End of quote. The second night is that uh, of the abundance of sin, in which, in which both the Jews and the Gentiles language, and which the Dominus also, also detects in his own days in the papal court in Rome, so, uh, in, at the court of the papacy. And I quote again, O horrible night, O palpable shadows, O intolerable blindness, end of quote. The third night is that of negligence and numbness, um, which means the neglect of faith when it is already uh, available. Now, the Dominus lavishes by far the most attention on the fourth night, that of error, which obviously has to do with the, with the context in which he speaks. Uh, of, it's basically of doctrinal error. And I quote, a night all the more dangerous since deplorables think that only they enjoy the light and want that all the others that not adhere to him are in shadows, end of quote. And it's hard not to read this um, quote and uh, not to think of uh, current problems of uh, polarization. Huh? And this night is the night of doctrinal fallacies and the delusions of the Roman Catholic Church. And so uh, the Dominus then continues by explaining four doctrinal errors, which all have to do with the figure and the supremacy of the Pope. Then, after explaining uh, these four types of nights, in the second half of the, 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 Dominus sermon show, the Dominus sermon shows how various forms of light overcome each of these four nights. And obviously, the advent is then presented as the hope of the victory of light over shadow, of truth over uh, error. Now, in a way, you could say that the, this text that I uh, briefly presented to you here uh, illustrates uh, the point made in the program uh, of this uh, conference. Namely, that before the advent of large-scale artificial light, uh, which uh, basically begins around the 1700, uh, early 18th century, the sphere of night is conceptualized mainly as an absence of light and as such, uh, as a default condition that needs to be overcome. And as the Dominus uh, himself says, what is night but the absence of light? Night here, uh, appears to be a, a negative. But I think that his text actually complicates this uh, uh, assessment uh, a little bit. Huh? Because uh, in a way, in, in his sermon, night is also something that is very active. It's not just a, 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 a residue, huh? but uh, it is a, a force, a force for evil. Huh? but an uh, agent nonetheless. Yeah? Night and days are opposites, yeah? and each of these opposites is as active as the other and is defined by a clear set of values and associations. If night is the absence of light, it is also a presence that needs to be overcome. Yeah? And as such, and you actually already hinted at in the discussion uh, uh, this morning, yeah? a condition uh, that allows light to shine. And exactly this dynamic turns the cycle of night and day, and the fact that night and day obviously are in a cyclical relationship, uh, combined with the course of the seasons into such powerful metaphors. Uh, they allow to envision how night imposes its presence why, when light disappears, and how this presence is then again, again challenged and overcome with the re-emergence of light. And of course, this cyclical idea in an early modern Christian context identifies these values with the role of Christ as the redeemer of humanity, an association expressed in the identification of Christ with the Son and of light with truth. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, so this is just uh, uh, an, an allegory of truth produced by Bernini, where uh, uh, truth is holding the Son, of course, that sort of reveals 
uh, her. Yeah? Moreover, uh, there is an in inherent temporality uh, in the presence of night and the absence of light and its reversal. And this temporality opens itself up to comparison explanation. And, and that's actually one of the main points that I want to make to manipulation. So what I want to do here um, uh, in my presentation is to look at some examples of texts and events that um, illustrate how the dynamic or, uh, or the dynamic relation or the cyclical relation between night and day is given meaning and activated in the context that we're looking at, of course, to convey ideas about life, death, truth, lies, and so, and so, and so on. And, and how night and the active alternation between night and day is used metaphorically. So first of all, uh, explore a little bit how night is used as a, as a metaphor. And then in a second uh, step, uh, or as a second aspect rather, illustrate how the manipulation of day and night is used to perform these ideas huh? by turning day into night and night into day. Huh? Uh, the exchange transition between both is performed and made present and the metaphors associated with are you know, somehow demonstrated and made accessible. And I think there it's important to keep in mind that in this situation, namely, you could say mid 17th century Rome or Europe, uh, where this manipulation of night and day is a matter of great effort, uh, involves the mobilization of an enormous amount of means. Yeah? There is an apparent artificiality of this manipulation of night and day that is an intrinsic part of the performance. And so performance is actually uh, uh, all the more powerful because of its apparent artificiality. And then uh, as a third uh, point, uh, the manipulation of night and day, I want to suggest uh, actually thanks to this uh, artificiality uh, performs the performance of metaphor itself. And my apologies for the cryptic uh, uh, expression. Yeah? So if night uh, and day are metaphors for evil, good, earth, truth, Christ and Satan, yeah? night and day can also be read as a metaphor for the working of metaphor itself. Yeah? Light emerging from darkness is as the emergence of truth from obscurity, just like in a metaphor, insight and knowledge emerge thanks to an image that originally hid that, uh, uh, that kind of knowledge. So what I'll uh, do is uh, I'll explore uh, these three um, uh, thoughts, again, in the context of mid 17th century Europe in a Christian, actually uh, after leaving the Dominus exclusively uh, Catholic uh, context, by looking at a collection of episodes which might serve as the basis for further uh, discussion. So, and just to be candid about uh, how I went about it, I actually literally looked <laughs> at my files uh, to see where actually there was question of uh, night and the use of night, and you could say the activation of night uh, in case studies that I had been looking at uh, uh, before. And I tried to sort of arrange them in uh, an order that more or less makes uh, sense. So what I'll do is uh, start with two theoretical statements, uh, one about the metaphor of night and the second about the metaphoricity yeah, of night, yeah, of metaphor as night, uh, as a kind of uh, introduction. And then uh, I will look at a number of cases uh, where the manifestation and use uh, of the metaphor of night is uh, present. Uh, according to a gradient uh, or according to certain uh, logic. Um, first, we will look at an account of the eruption uh, of the supernatural, the use of uh, night actually to account for the eruption of the supernatural. Then we will look at the artificial recreation of such uh, eruptions and then its translation into permanent uh, architecture. So first we will look at night as an efficient uh, metaphor. Now the sermon of the Dominus uh, uh, activates the metaphorical potential of night by holding out, holding out the hope uh, that light emerges right when darkness is at its deepest and its longest in the midst of winter. 
Now, some decades after he delivered uh, his sermon, uh, another Jesuit uh, used the same metaphor to explain how a preacher could use the advent, uh, the birth of Christ, to illustrate that, and I quote, God chose to have the Savior born right when human malice was at its most extreme, end of quote. And the author in question is Emmanuel Tesoro, uh, who compiled an extensive treatise on metaphorical language, the Canopiali Aristotelico, so the Aristotelian telescope. So the, the idea is that the metaphor is actually a refraction of uh, uh, reality and produces uh, a new uh, image, which is at once attractive, but also uh, compelling and convincing. Now, as part of the treatise, uh, Tesauro explains how the preacher can use images uh, and uh, metaphors to uh, make his sermons more, uh, more uh, effective. And in this particular case, uh, the preacher can associate uh, the depth uh, uh, of human depravity uh, with the circumstances of the birth of Christ. And I quote, Midnight at the winter solstice, when the nocturnal shadow has joined its maximum length and the sun begins to turn towards us to lengthen the days and shorten the night, end of quote. And this circumstance established then a metaphor, and allows you to invent a metaphor in which, and I quote, shadow stands for sin, the sun for the Messiah, and daylight for grace, uh, end of quote. And the preacher can then formulate his witty argument, uh, and that is, and I quote again, that the son of grace should be born when human malice, uh, the shadow of humanity, was at its most uh, extreme. Now, what is interesting about Tizaro's metaphor is less the comparison at its basis than the various strategies that he proposes to visualize it. And so one suggestion is that he, the, the preacher can sort of stage a conversation between the four seasons, uh, uh, where they sort of uh, debate the privilege of having Christ born uh, during their uh, tenure. He also pre proposes to insert a short astronomical discourse into the sermon and have the audience marvel at the divine decision uh, to have the sun travel on an elliptical rather than a circular course around the earth. Yeah, so, um, uh, uh, so that the seasons change and nights and days shorten and lengthen. Yeah? And he writes, such story can be adorned so lively and represented with such expression that the uneducated understand it and the educated enjoy it. And finally, uh, Tizago invites the preacher, preacher to drive home the point by recalling that there is no such thing as a natural phenomenon without a supernatural meaning. So if light and shadow grow and diminish, the seas and seasons change, and Christ is born at the point of deepest darkness, right when the sun is about to return to us, it, it must mean something, namely that this heavenly sun is returning to us to chase with the rays of grace, the shadows of, uh, of sin. Now, what I think is relevant here for our discussion is perhaps less the comparison itself, but rather uh, how this comparison is visualized and how this visualization puts forward particular elements that make the metaphor of night and day effective. Night, day are presented as a part of a cycle and as part of a, a mechanism. The emergence of light against darkness can be predicted since all this forms part of an order. The deepest dark is the opposite of the brightest day and this changes. Now, this cycle pertains to different spheres of knowledge. Uh, on the one hand, it is something that we all know intuitively or uh, through our senses uh, or experientially. Uh, at the same time, it is also something that can be explained rationally and actually thanks to quite advanced uh, knowledge. And as such also has kind of, you could say, almost global universal uh, dimension, something that literally reaches beyond the place where you're situated because it invites you basically to uh, uh, imagine that when it's, winter here than that it's summer at the opposite end uh, 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 of, the, of the world. And a third point is, again, this almost self-evident association of the natural with the supernatural. Huh? The idea that this natural world points to a higher supernatural sphere of which it is the image. And as a consequence, 
the metaphorical charge of night and day is a fact. So the fact that night and day sort of as a natural thing signifies something else is a given. This is not something that needs to be constructed, but rather something that needs to be revealed. Uh, and it, this is what you need to understand, how the emergence of day uh, sort of coincides with the emergence of truth. So this brings me to uh, the next point, uh, night as the very image of figural expression, not just as a figure, but as the image of figural expression. Precisely uh, because uh, the uh, metaphorical charge of day and night is self-evident. It can be read as an image of metaphorical language itself. The day sheds light on that which is hidden by night. And actually, this conceptualization of of, uh, of metaphor was, um, I mean, I could say the articulation of this idea is something that we find in, in the writings of another Jesuit, someone who was actually quite deeply influenced by the previous one, Tesorgo, uh, called Claude François Ménétrier. Uh, and so you see his name uh, here, uh, who has written an enormous oeuvre, which uh, is, um, which he himself groups under the moniker of a philosophie des images, a philosophy of images which is a theory of how images work, uh, where uh, you could say the basic uh, assumption is that everything is an image. Yeah? So a word, an image, but also a gesture, movement, an object, be it artificial or natural, is always uh, an image, meaning it signifies always something else or above what it is, <clears throat> above its natural uh, meaning. So in a way, it's a kind of generalization of the theory of metaphor that we find uh, in uh, Tesoro. Now, one particular uh, kind of such uh, images is uh, our enigmas, uh, riddles, which are images that push the inherent obscurity of metaphors to their uh, limits. And uh, this is uh, uh, a kind of image that um, Tesoro uh, theorizes in his La Philosophie des Images in Enigmatique of uh, 1694, where uh, in general uh, terms, you could say the definition of an enigmatic image is an ingenious mystery that claims to cover with veils a different meaning than the one which these words and figures normally uh, represent. Now, Minitri sees this kind of cryptic expression, so uh, uh, which is an expression which explicitly aims at obscurity as a stylistic means with many uses. Um, it can be a nice game, and I mean, this is just a more or less random example of the, you could say, hundreds of, of, of examples you find in 17th century publications of anagrams, chronograms, uh, uh, and so cryptograms, which were incredibly popular and which fall under this uh, category of um, enigmatic uh, images. But uh, these enigmas are also, according to Minitri, a first line of defense uh, against the profane and ignorant. Uh, uh, so the enigma is also something that sort of protects and encapsulates valuable truths in, in, in a way sort of obscures them and covers them so that they remain untouched uh, and unspoiled. And exactly this covering involves the fabrication of an ingenious expression, which then, when it is sort of being experienced and decoded, produces aesthetic uh, uh, pleasure. Now, um, what is interesting here, also for our purposes, um, I think, is, uh, and I'm not going to read, read out this whole uh, quote, uh, that in a way, um, divine revelation is actually presented by uh, Minetri as you could say the paradigm of this kind of, uh, of the enigma. And if you just look at the first sentences, uh, it is religion that has consecrated the enigma by the obscurity of its mysteries. So because the mysteries of religions are so, so obscure, they be religion basically provides the first model of the enigma, these mysteries which are above the penetration of the human spirit. 
God, as the prophet says, hides in the shadows to instill respect in man, and his adorable shadows are to him like some kind of temple where he re resides in his immensity. And then the biblical quote, and God made darkness his covered, his tabernacle around him, dark waters in the clouds of the air. So God essentially is hidden, hidden to humanity. And actually everything that God actually produced is this kind of enigmatic image for which, of which the true meaning will only be revealed to those who actually uh, who enter uh, paradise yeah? we will only discover the true meaning of all these mysteries thanks to the lights uh, of glory and yeah? that's uh, the, uh, the quote here and so in all our knowledge in this life are nothing but obscure nights and enigmas that are diff difficult to develop so what uh, Minitri is saying is that obscurity shadow and night are the human condition yeah? So we basically live in the night in permanence yeah? we, because we live in the state of imperfect knowledge of higher things. Yeah? Everything uh, that is actually true, true truth yeah? is always veiled, uh, covered. Yeah? Or and to, put it, to put it in the words of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, uh, uh, we now see as through a mirror uh, darkly. In contrast, uh, the realm of true light is supernatural. Uh, it's heaven. Yeah? It's only there that we will discover uh, uh, the true meaning. And this is then a realm uh, of pure light. But precisely because of our human uh, condition, uh, there will always be a permanent process of negotiation uh, between darkness uh, and light. Manifestations of the divine in this world are like eruptions of light uh, into darkness. Yeah? But at the same time, the sights of the divine are covered and obscured in order to maintain respect and awe, yeah? just like the, the holiest of the holiest in the temple is sort of uh, obscured. So there's a very dynamic relation between light and shadow, which is basically, you could say, the dynamic of revelation and uh, error. But what is interesting, of course, is that Minitri uh, basically puts this dynamic forward as the basic structure of any enigma and by extension of any uh, metaphor. Yeah? There's always uh, and, and uh, uh, dynamic between obfuscation and il uh, illumination between image and truth. Uh, and as such, uh, there is always artifice uh, involved, uh, whether it's a divine artifice uh, of God who hides himself in the shadows or human artifice uh, uh, that tries sort of to uncover uh, truth uh, by uh, uh, exploring the enigmas uh, uh, imposed by the divinity, there's always uh, artifice uh, uh, involved. Good. Yeah. This brings us uh, to a third uh, uh, point, uh, uh, night as the site of the uh, supernatural. So what I want to do now is discuss uh, very quickly three applications uh, uh, of uh, this, what I actually would call a device, uh, the dynamic and artificial uh, relationship between darkness, or sorry, the dynamic between darkness and light as an artifice to stage insight and revelation. Uh, obviously always on the, uh, uh, in the supposition, uh, you could say on the basis of this very basic metaphorical reading of uh, night and light in, uh, 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 in terms of truth, error, uh, and so on and so forth. So a first case study, and I will go through it uh, quite quickly, is a foundation uh, legend of a church uh, near Brussels, um, uh, which emerged in exactly uh, the same period as the text that we are looking at here, uh, which was first published in 1642 which is the foundation legend uh, of the uh, chapel of the uh, Virgin Mary in Basse-Vavre, which is uh, 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 not far from uh, Brussels. Uh, it is also uh, a typical story in the sense that this kind of uh, story is uh, available about a good many number uh, of Marian chapels uh, across uh, Europe in, in Catholic uh, uh, territories. And it goes uh, as follows. Uh, Somewhere uh, in the year uh, 1050, uh, uh, neighbors uh, uh, 
of the site where eventually uh, the chapel would be built, often heard a kind of celestial humming and angelical music, uh, which was married to uh, superhuman uh, instruments, so kind of celestial uh, music. And they also saw um, uh, uh, lights that suddenly appeared even in a, a à travers les espaces ténèbres de la nuit, uh, in the deepest uh, shadows of uh, night. These apparitions obviously were, uh, uh, people started talking about the uh, apparitions, people came to visit the site, miracles uh, occurred uh, um, uh, amongst the people who came to witness uh, them. So soon it was decided to build a chapel on the site of these miraculous lights. But uh, actually not on the actual site, but a little bit further, because the site uh, where these lights occurred was a swamp, uh, which was unfit to uh, make a building. Uh, so the builders uh, chose a hill, which was a little bit further away. Um, but when they started building each day, uh, they found everything that they had done during the day uh, uh, had been removed. Uh, and put back uh, uh, in near the swamp, on uh, même façon disposé. So obviously, uh, 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 it was thought that Satan uh, was at work, uh, who was basically sabotaging the building of, of the chapel. So priests uh, stood guard uh, over the building site uh, during, obviously, the third uh, night. But what they saw was that suddenly, in the middle of the night, it, there was there was uh, the appearance of light uh, more brilliant than that of noon, yeah, in the midst of which one saw uh, the Queen of Heaven surrounded by angels. The angels uh, basically took apart everything that had been built during the day uh, and put it then uh, back near uh, uh, the swamp. Uh, and during the work of the angels, uh, one heard uh, the, 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 the Virgin speak, Je demeurerai dans cette vallée parce que je l'ai choisi. So I will stay here near the swamp because this is what I have chosen uh, uh, as my uh, site. And then I quote again. And little after that, uh, this heaven that was that had descended on uh, on earth uh, disappeared, and it left behind astonishment and admiration in the hearts of those who are present. So night is here uh, the setting for a miraculous intervention of a presence signaled by the eruption of a day uh, 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 that is more brilliant than uh, normal. Huh? And this, in this context, I think night again carries various uh, meanings. Um, seemingly it's the realm of Satan, huh? the, the moment where he performs his vile deeds and huh? the destruction of the new church. Huh? But uh, as such, it's actually the realm of error and confusion. Huh? Uh, the desires of the Vir Virgin Mary are confused with the actions of uh, the devil. Eh? And actually this confusion is rectified uh, by the inversion of night into day, eh? by a uh, manifestation or an eruption of the supernatural into the natural, eh? uh, by reversal of the natural order. Eh? And what I think is interesting, and perhaps it's a kind of side note, is that actually the, the, the site of the church near a swamp, eh? then almost becomes a kind of monument uh, to this reversal of the natural order that was signaled uh, by the miraculous events uh, 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 during the construction uh, of the chapel. And this, of course, in the fact that you could say this kind of reversal, uh, this inversion, this eruption of the supernatural uh, uh, signaled by the appearance of day in, in tonight is made uh, uh, permanent in the construction of the chapel, guarantees the success uh, of the chapel amongst uh, the faithful. Uh, obviously, the, the chapel continues to be popular, important, miracles occurs, healings, processions, and so on and so forth. Now, one of the things, of course, with which we uh, associate Baroque, and which I think is right, is that uh, exactly these moments of, you could say, the eruption yeah, of the supernatural into the natural of day into night is being artificially uh, reproduced. Yeah? That uh, the natural order is reversed uh, by means of the manipulation of night and day uh, to perform the manifestation of truth. Now, very famous and quite well-known examples of 
that kind of inversion are the installations built for the so-called quagantori adoration of the sacrament, uh, uh, ephemeral installations with the, the, the host at its center, uh, which were built uh, for um, a continuous adoration uh, of 40 hours uh, at its uh, base. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, of course, a practice that has uh, various routes um, became established uh, in the, uh, the north of Italy, mainly in, in Milan in the mid 16th century, and then became, you could say, institutionalized uh, in uh, Rome in uh, 1592, when Pope Clement VIII uh, instated the perpetual adoration of the sacrament in Rome, which would also always start in the Cappella Paulina in uh, the Vatican uh, on the first Sunday uh, of uh, Advent, and then after the 40 hours in uh, the Cappella Paulina, the, the adoration would continue uh, in other church, churches in Rome, so that the adoration would do kind of circuit throughout Rome over the year, always with uh, uh, the 40 hour uh, adoration on the first Sunday of Advent in uh, the Vatican. Now, uh, Clement VIII, when he instated the perpetual adoration of the sacrament, was quite specific that the installation built for the occasion occasion should remain uh, quite simple. Uh, so it should uh, the sacrament should be uh, and this painting, which is in the sacristy of the Jesu in Rome, actually shows uh, uh, the basic elements. There would be an illumination of no no more than six candles, uh, and the uh, sacrament would be veiled. So there would be a dark veil uh, uh, behind which. The sacrament would be uh, uh, displayed. Uh, still, uh, uh, especially from the second uh, or third decade uh, of the 17th century onwards, uh, the installations for the Quarantori be became uh, ever more uh, spectacular. Uh, the one that you see on the right is one uh, designed by Carlo Garnaldi for the Gesù in 1640. But what I actually want to look at a little bit, uh, in a little bit more detail is a description of um, uh, such an installation set up in 1620, of which we have no um, uh, uh, visual uh, uh, sources. Huh? But again, also, again, in the interest of time, uh, I will not uh, read it out. Huh? But it's basically the description of an underground oratory where you had to de descend uh, uh, literally uh, under the ground in a vaulted space yeah, where, according to the description, yeah, thanks to the um, uh, application actually of projections uh, with a uh, hidden uh, light source, it became possible uh, to imitate uh, the sun uh, in a way that was more splendid than uh, uh, the original. Uh, and where actually this artificial light was then reveal a scene of perfect, uh, uh, of perfect uh, 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 harmony, uh, a perfect landscape in uh, the deepest uh, of uh, uh, in the deepest uh, shadows. And again, uh, the emphasis is on the fact that uh, there is an enticing object, which in the, uh, the the eye reckons to be natural, while it is part of art, precisely because you have this kind of perfect. Uh, day uh, underneath, uh, uh, I'm looking for the uh, quote, anyway, it's, it's here somewhere, uh, uh, again, in the deepest bosom uh, of night, in the darkest bosom of the blindest uh, night. So we are again uh, looking at the logic of persuasion and conversion. Uh, the natural cycle of night and day and the seasons yeah, is uh, used to visualize the mystery of the advent of Christ. Yeah. But here the cycle is at once recreated, condensed, and literally uh, imagined and transformed into kind of holy uh, uh, theater. Yeah. Where, and this, I think, is absolutely key, where the night is as artificial as the day. Yeah. So first you create an artificial night in order to create an artificial uh, day. Yeah. Uh, where, moreover, this day is created with, uh, thanks to an invisible source uh, of light. 
so this is uh, again a representation of something very uh, similar yeah. i will skip this one uh, again because I'm, i think i'm running out of time yeah. very briefly um, you could say a, a kind of counterpart uh, to this kind of artificial day in the context of, of artificial night are funerary uh, installations uh, in churches which were uh, obviously um, uh, dark, uh, uh, unambiguously dark. And so I, I think these engravings give a very, um, very good idea. But where um, the darkness um, of the decoration uh, uh, serves and to to create or to establish a kind of literally liminal space, uh, which is on the one hand a place of death, uh, uh, the darkness associated with death. Uh, but also obviously uh, a place of the expectation of the afterlife, uh, which is um, uh, suggested by all kinds of decoration uh, onto uh, this dark uh, uh, background with skeletons, medals, reliefs, which are all in a kind of silvery hue, uh, which lights up uh, thanks to candles uh, and uh, torches. Uh, but where, uh, again, when you read the descriptions of, of an installation uh, like this one, uh, the artificiality of the whole thing is uh, put forward as its most central feature. The fact that it's ephemeral, that it's a decor an ephemeral decoration uh, of a permanent uh, uh, structure, where uh, one, again, is led into to darkness uh, to see, thanks to the flickering uh, of, the, of the, the candles and the torches, the hope uh, of the afterlife guaranteed on the one hand uh, by fame, but on the other hand, of course, thanks to the resurrection uh, of uh, the soul. What I think is also an important final aspect that these kind of uh, uh, funerary theaters share with the Quagantori uh, that I uh, showed before is their uh, immersive uh, quality, uh, of course. Uh, so it, it's the, the idea that there is kind of collective experience in, yeah? um, <clears throat> In, in a completely uh, controlled uh, uh, environment, uh, which obviously guarantees the heightening uh, of emotion um, uh, uh, and, as such, obviously, uh, the effect of uh, persuasion. And permanent scenographies of right, I will be very quickly. This is actually kind of permanent version of the um, the, uh, uh, the kind of ephemeral. Uh, um, decorations that we were just looking at and i think it's interesting there's also one contemporary uh, description of this this particular uh, tomb uh, which uh, says that the background is a field of pietra di paragone of very black marble as black as death is white uh, these two colors quarrel in giving more life to one <clears throat> more life the one to the other even though it seems as if the more one flourishes, the more uh, the more the other extinguishes itself. So life, death, black, white, darkness, and light uh, are again presented uh, in a kind of dynamic uh, relationship, and it's thanks to this dynamic relationship that again the metaphoricity of darkness and light is uh, activated. I wanted to talk a little bit about the um, Cornago Chapel, which is obviously yeah, uh, uh, an environment that you can read entirely as an architectural and scenographic uh, articulation of the eruption yeah, of light into the space yeah, of a dark uh, church interior, but where I actually wanted to focus mainly uh, very briefly on uh, these two elements, which are two uh, mosaics that sit uh, next to the uh, to the main altar, uh, where you have these uh, black tondi, uh, where you have uh, two praying uh, skeletons that look uh, upward, uh, upwards, uh, uh, and where obviously what these tondi represent is literally the darkness uh, of of um, uh, uh, of hell, or actually rather the darkness of purgatory. And so these are two souls in purgatory waiting for uh, salvation or uh, praying uh, in, uh, uh, while they're waiting for uh, the final uh, judgment. But here you could say, again, the darkness, uh, or you could say the blackness of marble is um, uh, used to evoke um, uh, 
the, the, the depth of a dark space in which the souls of the deceased language, languish. So to conclude, um, so what I have tried to do here um, is to offer a, a not entirely systematic topology uh, of the night in early, uh, you could say, in a kind of early modern mid 17th century Christian context with a focus uh, on Rome. With at its center uh, case studies that were drawn, and this is what I want to emphasize, uh, from events. So sermons uh, for the living, catafalques for the dead, quarantori, uh, where the sacrament is shown uh, through the faithful. So these are all situations with a very important performative uh, 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 dimension and where the meaning, you could say, of what happens is produced through the action that takes place around these um, uh, elements. Uh, a performative aspect that is as true uh, for the chapel as it is for the ephemeral uh, situations, uh, uh, ephemeral installations as well. Um, obviously, a chapel like the Cognago Chapel shows a dramatic uh, moment, yeah? but on a more basic level, it is also the place where one prays, uh, ideally in perpetuity, for the salvation of the soul. So some, something needs to be happen there in order for the whole chapel uh, to work. Now, what I think underlies this topology uh, uh, is that night and day are very available metaphors. Yeah? So they're incredibly accessible and they're incredibly easy in a way. So they can, they can very easily be associated with ignorance, sin, negligence, errors, death, and so on. But the reason why that this is that as metaphors, night and day are incredibly efficient. They relate to intuitive, exp experiential uh, uh, knowledge, but can also sort of be embedded in more sophisticated uh, considerations. So it's a kind of natural order uh, that is uh, available to all. And precisely because of that, and that's the next point, uh, it is open, night and day are so open to manipulation. Uh, when night becomes day and day becomes night, something happens, uh, something serious uh, happens. Uh, especially again, if night and day are so easily charged with metaphorical meaning. Uh, and this again uh, hints uh, at the very working uh, of revelation itself. Good, I will stop. Here, uh, I thank you for your attention. I will stop my show. So, um, Matan, it's you, I really appreciate lo, lo, your lecture. That's uh, quite obvious, uh, but I really, really uh, find some deep connection. The traverse. Um, the time we are exploring uh, in this um, in this seminar, um, maybe more than something uh, that is related to what you have said that I have still to absorb. I found some con um, some questions that go a little bit further in the time. But when you were talking, I was really thinking to what happened with uh, the affirmation of uh, Newton uh, discover of the optics uh, and the color of the light. How this was important for architecture, they react to that, and also to the world you were talking. So the, the, the enlightenment, the from, no? and the fact that, uh, uh, if I think in particular to the words of André Corbeau, since we are in Geneva, it's quite obvious to think at him, and what he have um, proposed as really the, 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 the blanchissement, uh, I don't know, the light, uh, and the way the architects and the artists to look, uh, to 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 the contribution to of the optics uh, of um, a Newton, it seems like quite established sort of dialectic or what you are saying. No, it's what what you think about. Maybe I was too unclear for the auditorium, but I saw you. Were <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah, 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 no. It's it's the fascinating. Um, Questioner, it's a fascinating uh, issue. So um, actually, I um, I think first of all, you could say on the on the purely technical level, yeah, uh, the the kind of um, apparati that I was uh, talking about are connected to um, 
uh, discoveries and experiments in, 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 in optics. So the, the, uh, the apparato where I showed uh, the long description and of which we don't have uh, any images uh, is actually incredibly um, uh, explicit about it. So it, it's really about sort of the <clears throat> rediscovery of the art uh, of, of projections of, of colored images through a, a, a hidden uh, uh, source uh, of light. Uh, and there are many uh, other connections, for instance, also just the fact that uh, Tizogo uh, uh, calls his uh, treatise the Canocalia Aristotelico uh, 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 is a clear indication of the fact that um, uh, this whole light idea of that uh, uh, the relation between light uh, uh, seeing yeah, and optics is something that is, is simply very much on, on the mind uh, of of of, uh, uh, of these people. Uh, so there, there's another uh, well-known case where actually Bernini designed the, the frontispiece of, of of actually one of the most important treatises on uh, optics in the in the in the in the in the 1630s. Again, also evincing actually quite clear awareness of uh, of uh, of what is um uh what is going on um <clears throat> uh, 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 so so in that sense the the um uh i think what you, what you see happening over the course of the 17th century and minute is 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 a very interesting uh example of that is uh that the I mean, this, you could say this whole uh, body of metaphors about light and darkness is obviously incredibly old. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you could say, part and parcel of, the, of the, the, the Christian tradition, which obviously then borrowed an enormous amount of, of uh, uh, metaphors from, from, the, uh, from the ancients. Uh, so the, the, I mean, uh, actually a lot of the iconography of, of uh, Christ as son is basically uh, an adaptation of Apollo as son and so on and so forth. Um, so, so this there's this whole body um, that is uh, somehow then negotiated or, or related to uh, again, literally what is being uh, being developed in in in, in uh, modern uh, optics. Yeah? Um, and the uh, what is interesting there, of course, is that um, uh, also authors like Minetri can't really sort of be blind to the to the contradictions uh, or, or at least uh, at the very least the tensions uh, that emerge when you when, when you try to uh, negotiate between the, the, those two worlds uh, tensions that were actually also very much proper to Newton's own work eh, where the uh, alchemical and, and the physical basically uh, 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 formed part of of of, of one uh, system of, of of thought so um uh the so also because i think uh and and in that sense there's a, and if you look at the at the research on fireworks uh, in the 17th century which is of course an incredibly important phenomenon and when you start thinking about the light and the artificiality of light in the 17th century there too uh, uh, the uh, there's an enormous amount of technological uh, innovative uh, 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 ness that is, uh, or uh, uh, technolo technological innovation that is being activated somehow to sort of, I think again, activate uh, incredibly old and almost archaic forms uh, of of, uh, uh, of communication and of and also as a means of sort of triggering. Uh, um, uh, uh, experiences uh, that, and as we saw this morning, somehow even go back to uh, ancient Greece. But at the same time, of course, these these uh, new developments challenge uh, um, uh, um, to some extent uh, uh, the validity, and you could also say the. Um, um how, how would i say it uh, uh the specificity uh, of of uh, of these uh of these metaphors i mean if, um if uh yeah I, i'll stop here okay 
This some question maybe Stefan Sebastian, you were you're looking. No, yeah. it's okay. <laughs> I, I see. I mean, qu questions in French or also this. Yeah. Does somebody that wanna ask in French maybe this one other wall that we have with the auditorium of francophone students? No. I'll, no. Okay, say so, maybe I have a small thing to to ask you. It's uh, mm -hmm. it's more than a question. It's one, I, I have to say I was very stimulated, especially for the details of your presentation. So I have many other things to ask, but it's, maybe it's not so uh, in the moment to do that. But at the end, you show the two marble at the base of uh, Capella Cornaro, yeah. and that made me talk to the first. Uh, uh, the first um, image of this figure coming out from the darkness that I know is Pietro Lombardo. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's not a bar relief, it's, uh, it's sort of, uh, but we can call bar relief in this in the case, yeah. that he did it uh, under the, 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 the ask of um, Bernardo Bembo for the tomb of uh, Dante in Ravenna. Okay. So they went okay. to the... the uh, Bembo was there. They refound the, the lost body of Dante. Obviously, it's very famous in Italy at this moment because it's, we are at the end of the seventh centenary of a poet. But in effect, it's the, this image is really Dante staying in between the outside of the darkness, his dead body that is supposed to be in the tomb on the back, and he's looking to us with his books and tried to speak. And it's it's a situation I never talked to that of, uh, until uh, I, I, I was listening to you. Yeah. And no, but, but that's an incredibly interesting category of, uh, of images, and you find them in, in very different uh, uh, contexts. Um, uh, and obviously, it's also related to the, to the I mean, the, somehow the iconography of the uh, Dance Macabre. May, uh, but, um, these, these ideas of, of this kind of liminal images coming out of darkness. Uh, actually, uh, a couple of weeks ago in, in, in Spain, in uh, Brita, we, we also saw a tomb, uh, in, uh, actually on the facade of a church where you had skeletons crawling from under the tomb, from, from the shadow uh, under the tomb. I actually, I hesitated putting it in, 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 into, the, into, the, um, um, into the presentation. Uh, where again, it is clearly about sort of the negotiation of, of um, uh, between this world and the netherworld, but where um, and shadow, darkness, and, and blackness, of course, uh, play very important uh, scenographic, but also a semantic uh, uh, role. But I don't know the example you refer to, so I would love to see it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll send you it. an image. Yeah, that would be fantastic. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. okay.